got to say, as I was watching the, the, the offering go out, I can't see very far back down the group, but I'm sure the, the back half is as good looking as the front half this morning. You guys, you should give yourselves a pat on the back. You're all so good looking. I'm just so, you know, like, so yeah, you know, I've worked out, you know, I clean up pretty well. So I don't know what the back half looks like because I can't really see that far with all these lights, but I'm, the front half, you look good, so I'm sure the back half looks just as good, if not better. And uh, we're, we're just blessed to have that in our church, just good looking people that love Jesus, right? Nobody's, you're like, you're, you're a tough crowd this morning. <laughs> Give you a compliment or like, yeah, well, you can do better than that. Well, it's time to get into the Word. Are you ready for the Word this morning? I know I am. I'm looking forward to this this morning. I think hopefully it'll challenge you. Hopefully that you, you will, you will um, it'll propel you to, to think things through a little bit more. Um, the title of today's message is, Not of This World. Not of This World. We are called to be not of this world. That's what it is. When we come to Jesus, we are no longer products of this world, even though our flesh is, our souls are not. And so we're going to look at uh, 1 John chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, you can open them there, turn them on to there. They'll be on the screen as well. But we are not of this world. We are called to be a peculiar and strange people. I know you're all looking at me like, well, you've got that down. I know, I get it. But it's true. We are called to be peculiar. We're, we're called to be different. There's supposed to be something that is uniquely um, different than what the world is used to seeing. In, in the life of a believer. And so we are called to not be of this world. Why is that important? Well, if, if we look and sound just like the world, we have nothing different to offer the world. And we are called to be the salt and the light of the world. You are called to be the salt and the light of the world. Why is the world in the shape that it's in? Because I think the church, the church, great big C, not just Alexis Park, the church... God's people, I think we, we can do better. And you can never improve until you realize you have a problem. And the first part is realizing even though you're saved, you're redeemed, you're going to heaven, you can still do better in your faith, your walk, and in, in your life following Christ. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Um, here's the main thought for today. Having a secular or worldly mindset will hinder your spiritual growth and relationship with Christ. I'll say that one more time. Having a secular or worldly mindset will hinder your spiritual growth and relationship with Christ. See, we are not called to religion. It's misunderstanding. that Anybody says, oh, I'm religious. No, you're not. If you are, run from it. Jesus says, the only thing religious that I accept is to look after the widows and the orphans and to watch over your faith. That's it. That's the only religion. Religious of... Um, I, I, go, I, I do this, I serve that, I go here, I don't do that, I don't do this, and that's good enough. That's, that's religion. Repetitiousness without the soul being attached. In the name of religion, masses of people have been murdered. In the name of religion, empires have been created and have fallen. In the name of religion, all kinds of bad political ideologies have been birthed but in relationship with Jesus Christ brings freedom, brings breakthrough, and brings a, a whole new way of approaching life. It doesn't look for creating our own earthly kingdom. It looks for the kingdom of God. And so if you have a secular or worldly mindset, it's going to hinder your spiritual growth. And that relationship that you have with God is not going to grow. And then you're going to wonder, why don't I hear from Jesus? Well, did you talk to him this week? It's pretty hard to, to, to hear from somebody when you don't talk to them. It, it's, it's, you know, try to have a friendship with somebody. Think of your best friend. Don't talk to them. Just be around them for, for an hour and say nothing to them. No matter how, what they ask you, no matter what they say, there's something wrong and you just don't say a word. You don't acknowledge them. You barely look at them. What do you think is going to happen in that hour if they don't slug you, Right? They're going to be awful upset with you or think that something is really badly wrong. Well, this is how we come about our relationship with God. In ebb and flowing manners. I mean, we may not do that all the time, but oftentimes in my life and oftentimes in a lot of people's lives, when they say, I'm not hearing from the Lord, I don't know what God wants, I'm confused, I'm worried, I don't understand. And the question gets asked, well, did you talk to him recently? Well, yeah, I asked him. Oh, you asked him. 
Oh, so he's your cosmic slot machine that you wanted your gypsy wish from. I don't hold back, friends. I don't have time. Jesus can come back today. We got to get our stuff straight. So we don't want to be hindered. We want to go away from all that nonsense, and we want to get into the real meat of the matter, which is it's loving Jesus, following God, and, and getting our lives right with him. And that is relationship. So we are not people of religion. We are people of relationship with the Most High God. Amen? There you go. So now we're on the right, the right track. The next thing is to watch the secular worldly mindsets because that's what stops the, the spiritual growth. When I hear Christians accept um, alternative lifestyles that God says that's okay and the word of God said clearly it is not, we're on the wrong track. We need to d- dismount from that track and get back on God's track. You, I want you to know that just because you're, you, you struggle with a sin or you're, you're afraid to call out doesn't mean that God doesn't love you, doesn't mean that God doesn't want to work with you, doesn't mean that God's given up on you, but he does want you to get, keep the main thing the main thing. And whatever is written in the word of God, all 66 books, that is his word to you. That is where you get your, your commandments. That is where you get your direction. That's where you get your morality. And that's where you get your spiritual strength from. And so, friends, we, we have to understand that. So let's look at, the, at the, the text, and then we'll break it down. 1 John chapter 2, three verses, verse 15. Reading from NIV. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Blessed be his, his word today. I'm going to start backwards. Normally I go back to the top. I'm going to start backwards. Lives forever. If we, if we take everything at face value without completely looking into the word of God, some people say, well, see, you, you, you're going to die, so you're not living forever. We, we are very clear, and it, in the, the text is laying out very clearly that the living forever is the soul. The, the spirit man, the spirit woman, is going to live forever in Christ Jesus. The, who wants to have this body anyways forever? No offense. I think we'd all like to trade this one in for, for an upgrade. Is anybody with me on that? And the older you get, the more you're like, oh, yeah, I'm ready for an upgrade. I'm ready for that new model to roll off the lot. Well, that, that, you know, that's, that's one of the promises of, of, of eternity is that we get a new, a new body. But in the meantime, the, the spirit man, the spirit woman, that's what lives on forever. That's what is promised eternal life. And so um, I, I like what we see here. Um, that the, the world and its desires pass away. The desires, the world's mindset, the world's sinfulness, it's going to pass away. It's going to die one day. But, there's that but that changes everything in a sentence. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. So my question to you, church, today is this. Are you doing the will of God in your life? Some, some people, if you probably be honest, you'd say, well, I don't even know what God's will is. Well, God's will is that, first off, you don't live in sin. Second part of God's will is that you are, are uh, saved and born again in Christ Jesus. It's a very simple will. God, God is very, very easy to, to understand if you, as far as what he desires for his people. We complicate God. Why is it little kids can comprehend the mysteries of God seemingly almost instantaneously? And we who have all this education, all these years of experience, the older and more wiser we get, it seems like we, be, we grasp God less and less and less. Because if you don't inherit the kingdom of God as a small child, you will in no wise inherit the kingdom of God, Jesus said. So friends, the world's going to pass away. The desires, the, even the sinful desires we have right now in our life, those are going to pass away. Those are going to die. Our bodies will die if Jesus doesn't come back in the rapture soon. But whoever does God's will, they're going to live forever. They're going to enjoy the presence of God. They're going to enjoy the fruits of their labor. They're going to enjoy the, the benefits of what salvation has done for them. So let's go back to verse 15. If we're not of this world, we have to understand, do not love the world. Do not do it. There, you know, the Bible has lots of do nots, but this is, a, I think, the most, one of the most important ones that gets overlooked. Stop loving the world. 
to we talk about God's kingdom coming, God's will being done here on earth as it is in heaven, that doesn't mean that we want to stay here, that we want to love the, the bricks and mortar here. What we want to do is we want to love God. Don't love the world or the world system. Or as we, we talked about uh, a, a, few, uh, a, a week ago, like Lot's wife, when she looked back at the longing of the world behind her that she was leaving, that was being destroyed, she was also destroyed. God doesn't share his kids well. If there's anything I've learned about being a believer is God does not share well. You know, that's the first thing we always tell our kids when they start making friends is make sure you share your toys. And they're like, I don't want to share my toys. They slobber all over it. They do all these things to my toys, right? But that's kind of the, the, a child's mindset. But God, you know, is a little bit like that too. He doesn't like to share you. He doesn't want to share you with sin. He doesn't want to share you with the devil. He doesn't want to share you with illness. He doesn't want to share you with, with the bad things of this world. He, he wants you for himself. And yet he puts you on loan to the world to be a light. Because God loves his kids. And he doesn't just have us, you know, be mindless robots. He gives us things to do. He blesses us with talents and abilities. He blesses us with influence. He blesses us with, um, with his power so that we can go out into the world and, and have something productive to do with that soul that he birthed in us. But it starts by not loving the world. If we're not of this world, we can't love the world. But you notice that John goes on a little farther. He says, not only do not love the world or anything in it. Does that mean you can't go on vacation or have a nice car? That's not what, what he's saying here. Love is a, is, a, is a very poor English word. A very poor English word. English just, just butchers the word love. It's a, it's, a, it's a pet peeve of mine. The love that we're talking about here is, is deep-seated soul love. Don't, don't love something that your identity is wrapped up in. So if your identity is wrapped up in your, in your car, you've got a problem. If your life is wrapped up in your job and your career, problem. If another person takes precedence over your relationship with God, there's a problem. Y your love is misplaced. And so what, we, we, what John is saying is don't love the world. Don't fall in love. Don't let, it, don't let it take your eyes. Don't let it take your heart. Don't let it capture your thoughts. Go and enjoy a vacation. Go and for your walks. Enjoy nature. Go and build things and, and you know, conquer all kinds of stuff. That's great. But do it in the name of the Lord. Do it um, with God as directing you, not as God as an accessory. So my question, church, is God your accessory? Or is he the Lord of your life? Question we need to ask ourselves. And, and John is, is addressing that here. He says, anybody who loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. That's a scary verse, isn't it? Think of it. Think of the things you love. You love uh, people love their kids. I know people who love their puppies more than they love Jesus. Sure, they love their little, their little doggies way more than God. If somebody said, will you die for your faith? Sure. Well, will you? Will you they, they might say yes, but if you put the, will you die for your, your dog? You'll not touch my dog. Take, take me, leave my dog. It's like, are you serious? And then all the martyrs all over the, the centuries who were lit on fire in Nero's courts and thrown into the Colosseum and eaten, who are beheaded over in the Middle East at this point in time and in Africa because they, they believe on the name of Jesus and they refuse to bend their knee to any other jurisdiction on this planet. And they die for their faith. And we would rather die for our puppy dog. For some of you, that might be a little hard to digest. But the reality is this. Not that you shouldn't have a little puppy dog and look after it. Do that. I'm a farm kid. I love dogs. Cats, on the other hand. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not saying, this is the thing. You can have your cake and eat it too a little bit with, with the Lord if you keep things in the right priority. And that's what John is saying here. Don't love the world. You're going to have the stuff. You need to have clothes. Jesus even talked about that. I know how to clothe you. I know how to feed you. God wants to take care of you. You need stuff to live. God's not oblivious to that. But when your love for the stuff and for the things of this world are more and more important than the Lord, you have a problem, and you are now you're becoming of the world. Remember the old, the old hymn? And the things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and fame, or name. Grace, thank you. It's been a while. It's been a while. 
But it's true. The things of this world, the more we, we the, the brighter Jesus becomes in our life, the, the brighter the word of God becomes in our life, the dimmer the things of the world should become. It shouldn't, it shouldn't capture you as much. This is why you cannot say you're a Christian, love God, and continue to practice openly sinful acts that lead to death. What are those sinful acts that lead to death? Well, I'm going to let you read it from the word. We're going to continue on about not being of this world. Not because I don't want to address it, I will in the fall. But if I give you everything, then it's, it's lazy faith. Lazy faith, it's not good faith. If you've got to go and, and search through the word of God, there are things of the, uh, that, that a lot of Christians take on, that progressive Christianity circle, that we often get looped into because it's so, it draws us. Unfortunately, friends, it leads us away from Jesus. Sloppy grace is just as dangerous as legalism in the kingdom of God. Some of you say, well, what's legalism? What's sloppy grace? Sloppy grace is this. Because Jesus loves you so much that you can, even though that you continue to sin and do all kinds of things, God will overlook it now because you, you acknowledge Jesus. The demons acknowledge Jesus and they're still going to hell. How much more do you think God's people think that they're going to get away with it? Jesus said, uh, many of you will, will say, I drove out demons and did miracles in your name. And he'll say, depart from me, I never knew you. That if that doesn't put a, a, a shudder down your spine every time you, you say it and read it, then, then I, I suggest that you need to get back to the main thing of serving God. And so then verse 16, he says this, and this is where we're going to kind of get the crust of it. For everything in the world, everything, not some things, not a little bit, for everything in the world. And then what does he say? The lust of the flesh. So clearly we're talking sexual, but not just that. The lust of the eyes, that's coveting, and the pride of life. Our desires, it's lust. Lust is not something, it's just wanting something. Lust is to the point where you crave it and it is uncontrollable and, you, and it controls you and you don't control it. Lust is a perversion of desiring, of longing. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Pride is the original sin. It drove, it drove out uh, Satan from heaven because he was so prideful, he thought he was the best, that he could even take on God. Pride that a third of heaven at that time left with Satan thinking that they, one day they could come back and take on God. You're never going to take out God. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord one day. Whether they're an atheist today, whether they're a Marxist today, whether they serve another God today, tomorrow, yesterday, or, to, or next week, the fact of the matter is this. Anybody who does not call in the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior will be condemned to hell. But there is a way out. Come to the cross and leave it there. Leave all of your pride Leave all of your lusts, leave all of your burdens, leave all of your hurts, leave all of your disappointments, leave all of your victories right there. And from that starting point, you become the new man, the new woman in Jesus. And from there, life starts to take on a whole new uh, meaning. Because he says, it, these lusts, this pride, does not come from the Father, but from the world. When we are so absorbed by the world, we make no impact on the world. It is time for the church, Christians who are convict, have deep conviction to follow Jesus, to get involved in school systems again. To get involved in places of politics again. To get into, into, into businesses, to, to become managers and to become the influencers, to get involved in media to take over the news. Wouldn't it be amazing if true, born-again, Bible-believing believers were in charge of the news, how much more honest it would be? I don't care if anybody who doesn't agree with that. The reality is, if you are truly um, submitted to Jesus, you will tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you, God. We will, not, we will not confuse our kids with bad ideologies taught by demons. We will tell them that they are fearfully and wonderfully and beautifully made by God in heaven. And it doesn't matter that they, they may have a flaw here or there in their appearance. The fact of the matter is, God loves them right where they are. And all they need to do is pick up that from Jesus. So church, we're called to influence the world, but not be of the world. So how do we prevent spiritual contamination from the world or of the world? 
Number one, it takes commitment to live for Jesus. It takes commitment to live for Jesus. My question to you, church, is do you live for Jesus? That's a very small response. Do you live for Jesus? Do you get up in the morning thinking of, uh, of God? Do you get up throughout your day and say, God, how do, how do I do this with you? How do I do this for you? How do I do this in your name? How do I do my job? How do I love my wife? How do I look after my kids? How do I be a good community member? How do I do this for you? That's the way we've got to approach life. God, you bless me with, 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 uh, with resources and wealth. How do I use this for your kingdom? See, people who are spiritually immature will say, oh, we're supposed to give it all away because Jesus said to the rich young man, give it all away. No, he said to that rich young man, give it all away because Jesus knew that that rich young man had a pride problem. He was all consumed with his wealth. There were lots of other people that Jesus saved. We think of the tax collector who, who come to Jesus. He said, I'll give back everything. And plus, Jesus didn't say give it all away. And he even came and buy it kind of like a crook. See, it depends on where your heart is at. So it takes commitment to live for Jesus. So when I say, are you committed to live for Jesus? Is everything in your life, you, you, everything that, that, is, that makes up you and that you, that you have effect on, is it committed to, to following Christ? Proverbs 16, 3 says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. If you want to have your, the plans that you lay out be established, commit them to the Lord. Why is that important? Because you're putting, before you go into that, that situation, you're asking God, is this what you want me to do? How often do you go looking for a job, looking for a spouse, looking for uh, an investment? Do you, do you pray about it before you do it? Do you say, God, what should I do here? How should I do this? Where should I go? What should I take? Should I go with this one? Should I go with that one? Do you ever sit down and just spend uh, uh, some time with the Lord and just wait for him to kind of lead you by the Holy Spirit to which you should go? Which way you should go, sorry? Commit your work to the Lord. Commit it. Be committed. Everything you do. Not just serving on church. When you're at home and nobody else can see you and it's just you and, and, the, and, and the quiet house and nobody else can see you, commit to not being full of lust. Commit to not being full of pride. Commit to Jesus. Start there. A.W. Tozer says, if I, am holy, follow, if I am to wholly follow the Lord Jesus Christ, I must forsake everything that is contrary to him. And it's true. If you're going to really follow God with everything of who you are, you, you, you must forsake the, everything that, that, that is around this world, the love of it, and follow Jesus. It's, it's completely impossible to, to have two loves. I know we say that we, we make the joke, you know, when, when somebody says, well, Sean, do you want bacon or do you, do you want uh, ice cream? Well, I could love two things. But, you know, the, the fact of the matter is when it comes to life, you can't have two loves. You will either be devoted to one, Jesus said, and hate the other, or you'll cling to one and, and, and hate the other. You, you, you just can't serve two masters. Unfortunately, some people are so, so uh, deceived in their, in their understanding that they think that they can have one foot in the world and one foot uh, with the Lord and God will accept that. God doesn't share, friends. Today is the day of salvation. You don't, tomorrow's not promised. And so you know, it takes commitment. You have to say, you know what, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push through. I'm going to serve. I'm going I'm to follow God. I'm going to live for him. I'm going to honor him when nobody's watching and the camera lights are off and when, when there's no eyes looking at me and I can get away with things, I'm going to choose the high road, and I'm going to honor the Lord. When somebody tries to, to talk me down and, 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 uh, and malign my name and hurt me in that way, I'm going to bless them. When I have the opportunity to take a little more than I'm, I'm supposed to, I'm going to leave it there because I'm not supposed to. I'm going to honor the Lord. Romans 2, uh, 12, 2 says, Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, and pleasing, and perfect. How do, how do you change? How do you be, learn God's will for you? By allowing God to transform you into a new person. Notice it didn't say by letting your identity stay in your old sins. Whole new person. Born again. This is why we like to use that term. We are born again. The Pharisees hated that term. 
If we had time to go back, which we don't, but if we had time to go and do a little word study on, on Jesus' ministry when he's talking with the Pharisees and they, he mentions born again and they get all confused and they talk like, are we supposed to crawl back into our mother's womb? How's that going to happen? They're so confused because they're so worldly focused, religiously focused. They're not in relationship with God. So don't copy the behavior and the customs. And, and it's very simple. How do you avoid being coming like the world? Stop copying the behavior and customs. If the world says this is good and we know the word of God says it's not, don't do it. It's not that hard. At least on paper. When, when the practice comes along, it can be hard. Sometimes you're going to have to walk away from things in your life when you come to Jesus that feels like your heart's being ripped out. But that's only temporal. As your new heart begins to grow inside of your, your spiritual man or your spiritual woman, you'll, be like, you'll look down if you stick with it. Uh, down the road, you'll look back and go, that was the best thing I ever gave up. Maybe it's a friendship with somebody who's a bad influence on you. Maybe it's a, a job that you know you can get a better job or a different job and, and it won't wreck your soul. It won't leave you feeling gutted in your faith. And so maybe you've got to change jobs. I remember when I came to Jesus for a long time, I had to remove a lot of certain music from my life because it was just so influential at that time being such a young person. Uh, and I, I couldn't listen to it anymore because it constantly would take me down a path. Not all songs, it wasn't songs of swearing and stuff. I'm not really that radical a guy. But you know, it just, some of the themes of those songs would lead me away from the Lord and not to him. Whatever it is, if it's going to take you to hell, cut it out. Cut it off, discard it. Jesus said, it is better to go to heaven, and, and if, your eye, sorry, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It's better to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with two eyes. And, and now is Jesus saying, literally, you should just gouge out your eyeball, half is going to come back next week, half blind? What Jesus is getting at, again, is use your head. He's using the metaphor that if something is so bad in your life, that is so influential and is so worldly that it is keeping you from seeing, hearing, and, and understanding the Lord, get rid of it. Give it away. Let it go. Burn it in a trash can, whatever it is. Not people. But maybe you have to stop being in a relationship with them. At least you may have to put them at arm's length. You see what I'm saying, friends? It's very simple, but we, we lose track on that because we're so afraid of losing something. But are you so afraid of losing that something in your life that you value? Or are you more concerned about losing that soul that you're working on that you want to spend eternity with the uh, Almighty God? So it takes commitment to leave Jesus. Number two, uh, guard your mind against deceptive arguments. Oh boy, this is a big one. I should do a whole message on this, but I'll, I'll give you uh, the quick run through on this one. Because it's self-explanatory, but allowing your mind to accept a half-truth can cause lasting spiritual damage. You have to guard your mind against deceptive arguments. Allowing your mind to accept a half-truth. And that's what Satan did in the garden with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve are in the garden, right? They haven't sinned yet. It's all wonderful. There's no problems. Then they have a little conversation with Satan. And he plants the seed of did he say you, you, he didn't, he didn't say you will surely die? A little deceptive twist on what God said when he said, yes, you will die. It will kill you. If you, if you go down this, this temptation path, it will kill you. And so we have to understand that when we allow our minds to accept the half-truth, like, oh, it's okay that I, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I only sin a little bit. You're not going to see anywhere in your Bible where God says, oh, it's okay. Oh, you only sin a little bit. Okay, that's good. That's all right. I'll let that slide. He, God doesn't let things slide. He can't. He's holy. He, he's righteous. And he wants us to live in that. He wants us to partake of that. And you can't share righteousness with unrighteousness. They're polar opposites of one another. So let's make sure we guard our minds against deceptive arguments. 2 Corinthians 10.5 says, We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. The knowledge of God. That's really what we're, what's happening when you're getting that temptation. The knowledge of God and what he says. And we take captive or we arrest every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So when, when that person cuts you off and you want to you know, get out and deal with it, arrest that thought quickly. So you, you don't get arrested physically. But honestly, you know, take captive every thought. You know, if you're, if you're dealing with lust and, 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 and that, well, stop watching those shows. Find a new outlet. Do some exercise. You know, 
Change your habits. It's not that, that we, we can, we're going to experience salvation because we change our things and do it. We win in salvation on our own. But we are called to do stuff. This is one of the irritations that I have with, with faith, is that sometimes we, know, we see all the promises of God and we, we, can't, we can't enter heaven on our own strength, our own power, our own will, our own ideas. But yet we're still called, once we come to Jesus, we still have to take the steps ourselves to move away from the old life that we had. The flesh says, oh, don't move away from there. It's okay. Okay, we just won't do that one now. You ever had your flesh tell you something like that? Oh, you just, you just won't. It's okay. You don't have to do that one now. It, we'll just stop doing that. The rest of these are, are good. They're not so bad. It's just a white lie. Are you sure about that? Are you sure about that? Is it just a white lie, or is all lie a lie? And so, did Jesus tell white lies? Chances are, if Jesus didn't practice it, probably means we shouldn't practice it either. So I'll leave that with you. Winston Churchill said, a lie gets halfway around the world before the truth gets a chance to get its pants on. <laughs> I love Winston Churchill. I could quote him all day long. The man is amazing. Not exactly the, you know, the nicest person in the world, but I'll tell you, he got some quotable quotes. But it's so true. You know, a lie is all the way around the world. We see that in our media right now. And I, I'm not going to pick on any particular media, just in media in general, news media. You know, the lies get around the world many, many times. And the truth, you're barely ever lucky if you ever it even sees the light of day. And so we who are in Christ Jesus have to dig for the truth. And what is it that Jesus offered us? The truth. And the truth does what? Sets us free. Is there anybody in this house that wants to be free here today? Amen. The truth brings you freedom, even if it may hurt your feelings for a little while. And I got to tell you, over my lifetime, and even currently at times, when you go through and God, and God points something out in your life, you're like, that, I don't like that. That hurts. I want you to know that, that that's part of it. Sometimes God's going to hurt your feelings. But if it's going to redeem your soul, then it's so worth it. Amen? <laughs> and then the last thing today... Never apologize for honoring God's word. I was, I, when I was writing this point out, I, I was going to say, God, don't apologize or don't, don't worry about it. No, no, no. You know what? The world is bold and brazen. We're going to be bold and brazen right now. Never apologize for honoring the word of God. When somebody has a problem with your belief in, in traditional family, you tell them that's God's only way. And I make no apologies for it. And if they want to cancel you and, and ridicule you, bring it on. Because at the end of the day, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Your faith in Christ becomes powerful when you stop calling God's principles, or stop caring, sorry, that God's principles will offend. The gospel is offensive to those who are perishing. Before you knew Jesus, the principles of the word of God were offensive, weren't they? How dare you, God, say, I can't swear and curse and be lustful of my flesh and, and do what I want with my wealth and how dare you but when you come to Jesus it's like I can't believe it how could I have ever thought like that and you're so repentant of your soul you realize God I was so wrong I'm sorry the only apology we should ever offer is to God for the sins that we have committed and once we've done that we now walk on the path of forgiveness we don't live in those things any longer. We take on the new life, the new man, the new woman, and we walk forward in power and in the truth of Jesus. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Foolishness. The cross is foolishness. How many people have, have you heard make fun of the cross? We see all the big uh, music stars right now making fun of the cross, putting themselves on the cross, being crucified. Make, make no mistake, they would never allow themselves to be crucified on the cross for people who hated them, let alone somebody they loved. Only Jesus could do that. Not even us could do that. And they mock, they mock it and they make fun of it. I want you to know, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Oh, but to those who have tasted what salvation is all about, it is, and is being saved by, it is the power of the living God to get things done. Amen? And so we have power, we have faith, we have hope in Jesus because of the cross. So never apologize for honoring God's word. When the world's trying to cancel you, their sins are going to cancel them one day. And they're going to try to show up at, at the, the gates of heaven, and they're going to be redirected to the gates of hell. 
because they never yielded their, their life to Jesus. And what a sad day it's going to be. They were so popular, and they did good things, some of them. And they, they, were, they were nice to a lot of people, but they didn't take Jesus on as their Lord and Savior and, and re reject their old life. And for that, they get the punishment of eternity in hell. In this thought of not apologizing, I'm going to finish on this. Joshua 24, 15. And he says to the nation of Israel, he gets to a point where he, that's it, we're not, we got it, it's go time. You're either going to get, you're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. You're going to walk the talk or not. And he says, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And that's where we have to get to, friends. We have to get to that point where if it seems evil around the world to be a Christian, so be it. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord to the end. If that means to my, to my death, then so be it. If that means to dying to myself until Jesus takes me home, so be it. But I will serve the Lord. If all of you back out, I will still be here next week. And, and, and during the week, I'll still be serving him there. Doesn't matter what everybody else does. I don't live your life. I don't walk your life. I don't, I don't, I'm not in your shoes. But my shoes, we are walking with Jesus because I, I got nothing else to go back to. So friends, we're not of this world. Remember that. Guard your mind. Guard your heart. Remember, it takes commitment to live for Jesus. Guard your mind against deceptive arguments and never apologize for honoring God's word. And I can guarantee you this much, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free each and every day. As you get better and better and closer to Jesus, you will see your life, all the old things will start to fall off and that new man or woman will be revealed in kind as you move closer and closer to Jesus. And as a little bonus, as I mentioned at the very beginning of this, you might just hear his voice a little bit better too. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for what you have done in our life. We don't want to be people of the world. We want to be in the world, not of the world. The substance of our lives needs to be wrapped up in the cross of Christ, in the, in the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, in, in the, the Holy Spirit working through us and, and, and in us that we could live for you. And so today, Lord God, for those that are struggling to not be part of this world, I pray, God, that today would be the day of that, that decision to not be like the world anymore, but to look for your will for their life. To, to give up things that maybe has been holding them back and hindering them from, from getting deeper into their walk with you. Lord God, for those that are struggling today to know you, or maybe they don't know you at all, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day of breakthrough. Today is the day of miracles. And all we need to do is ask and believe. And so Lord, help us, for those that are struggling or may not know you, to ask and believe on Jesus to leave the old life at the cross, to pick up the new life and walk forward in you. Help us to not be people of the world, but to be people of God. Strengthen us with your Holy Spirit. Bless each and every one as we honor you with our lives. In the powerful, mighty name of Jesus, and everyone said,